Thank you. 
Lord, that no matter if we're poor, no matter if we're wealthy, no matter if we're sick, no matter if we're well, no matter, Lord, if, if we stand in need or if we stand not in need, Lord, you are more than enough. And, Lord, today we can trust you with our lives because, Lord, we know that we have already been chosen and loved. We have already been called out by name, Lord, and that, God, because of you, we have no need to worry. We have no need to be concerned because you, our provider, will provide all things, Lord, body, soul, and spirit. And, Lord, if you clothe the lilies, how much more will you clothe us? If you watch the sparrow, how much more is your eye on us today? Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what valley, no matter what mountaintop, no matter what pit or prison we find ourselves in today, your eye is on us, Lord. And God, you are more than enough. And God, we can find contentment in every situation because we have you on our side. And we have you, Father, working all things for our good. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for all that you have done. And Lord, for your protection over our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And when you, before you're seated, I want you to look at your neighbor and just say, neighbor, he's more than enough for me. How about you? He's more than enough for me. How about you? Spirit of the 
Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Say anointed me. Anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty. Say liberty. Liberty. To the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I'm going to read John 8 and 36. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to read it. And it basically says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for this opportunity. God, I pray that I do not try to bring forth this sermon or this message, Father, in my own ability. Because, Lord, if I do, it will hit the floor and it will not affect anybody's life. But, Lord, if I approach it through the vein of the anointing, if the anointing rests upon me, Lord, then it will change people's lives. And it will help change their mentality. And so this morning, Lord, I ask that you will hide me behind the cross of Calvary. And that this morning, Lord, that the, the dove, the Holy Spirit, the precious anointer, will rest upon my lips and upon my heart today so that I can declare the word before your people, Father, and encourage them and remind them that, Lord, if we are in Christ and if we have received you, then we are free and we are free indeed. And that, Lord, we are no longer bound, but we are sons and daughters. Father, today I pray that you'll use me to preach this word in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. On any holiday, but especially one like today, there's a lot of things that are going through our mind. We start wondering what we're going to do tomorrow. We start thinking about what time the fireworks may be going. We, we start planning our menu for anything to get together. To, and we, we start thinking, as, as we're doing today, you know, maybe if it, the rain holds out, if we're going to go to the beach, if we're going to go do this, we're going to do that. We have all these things going on in our mind. And we just... We just tend to go through every holiday just so rushed and so, you know, distracted by everything going on. But today, as I was preparing, or this week as I was preparing, I thought about what today or what tomorrow really represents. We know that tomorrow represents, you know, a 246th anniversary, I believe, of our nation's freedom because of what our forefathers did and those who have fought for our freedom, that we can celebrate liberty. We can celebrate living in the land of the free, in a place where people can pursue happiness and people can come and, and have freedom from oppressive nations and oppressive governments. And so as I was thinking about this, I thought about just the word freedom. I thought about being free. And as we live in a free nation, though, I begin to think about the fact that while we live in the greatest nation on the face of the planet, whether you know that or not or believe that or not, despite all of our problems, we still are greatest nation that there is. No other nation has the liberty that we have. And even though I don't agree with stuff going on, I am grateful to be a United States American citizen and to live in the land of the free because of the brave. And I'm grateful for what our forefathers did. But as I was thinking about our nation and thinking about freedom, I started realizing that a lot of people, especially those in my generation and those following, and even some in the previous generations, don't really understand what it means to be free. There's a lot of Americans who will celebrate this holiday and they will talk about it being, you know, a, a day of freedom, a day of liberty, but they don't truly grasp the concept of what it means to live in a free nation. See, a lot of, they, they, they've just bought into what the government has told them about what freedom means. And even though, even though we still have some freedom, there are still some oppressions going on in our government. If you don't believe it, just look at some of the things they prevent us as the church from doing. Hello. We live in a free nation, yet some of our rights are being infringed upon, and the government should never infringe upon rights. But because of this misconstrued definition of freedom and what many people have accepted, a lot of people do not know and do not fully grasp what it means to be a free United States American citizen. And Sister Eunice, as I thought about that, I, I began to think that there's a lot in the church who have the same mentality. Yeah, there's, there's a lot in the church who claim Christ and who are really saved and who will talk about I'm free in Jesus, yet they have yet to fully grasp the reality of what that freedom is. They, they go throughout their life and they, they still live in a down and out mentality. They, they're saved. No doubt, they confess the Lord and they, they pray, but then they live so defeated and they live so bound up and they live so imprisoned, and yet they talk about being free. I don't know about you, but I, you know, that, that slave talk to me. If you're always negative, you're always defeated, you can't find, you know, you don't tell me you're a Christian, but every the world is your is your enemy, and 
you know, you're just, your lip hangs so low, you can suck marbles out of a gopher hole, and, you know, you look like you've lost your best <laughs> friend. I mean, if you, you know, that, that is not the mentality that God intends for his people to have. The Bible says that happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Amen. And a lot of us aren't happy. And there's different reasons for that, but I believe that the main reason is because we, many of us, have yet to comprehend what we have received when we received Christ. I read a story this week of a man who was a foreigner, and he, he became an immigrant to the United States of America. And he, I think he, he came into uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco, somewhere like that. And uh, he had come from a, a oppressive nation where there was a curfew every night at the same time. And, as he got into this place and got all this paperwork handled, he immediately started going and seeing all of these things he'd only read about. Started seeing the, the San Francisco Bridge and all of these all of these landmarks. And before you knew it, the day just got away from him. And he noticed that dusk was settling and that and that it was starting to get dark and he began to panic. And so he found a guy who was who was getting into a cab and he, he or and he told him, he said, You've got to get me back. You've got to get me back to my room. And he's speaking in broken English, and the man said, Hold on. Calm down, what is it? He said, you've got to get me back. you got to get me back. It's getting late. I've got to get back. And it took him a minute, but then the man who was getting in the cab realized that this man was an immigrant and that somehow he had not yet understood that he was in the land of the free. And so he told him, he settled him down, and he said, look, sir, he said, I don't know exactly what situation you've come from. He said, but you don't have to get home when it's dark. You are in America now. You can stay out as much and as late as you want to. There is no curfew here. But this man, while he had come to a new place and to a new land, he still had the old country mentality. I think the problem with some of us in the church is we still got the old country mentality. We've yeah. come into a new relationship with Christ. We've been saved. We've, we've walked with the Lord. But for whatever reason, we still have the old country mentality of being worldly or, or, or being bond slaves or being oppressed. And we, we just have yet to understand that if we are in Jesus, then we have been made free. We have yeah. been set free and free from all things. Today I want to help lift the veil of that mentality off of many of you. And you may, before you go ahead and assume that this message is not for you, I just want you to hone in on what I'm going to say. Because even me, myself, is thinking, God, why would you have me preach this? There's no, you know, even I don't feel this way. But then the more I got into it, the more I realized there are still things that the enemy tried to plant in my mind to convince me that I am not fully free. And so today I want all of you to walk out of here realizing you are free. You have no reason to feel defeated. You have no reason to feel captured. You are free and free indeed. But before Amen. I tell you what we've been freed from, we need to talk about the source of our freedom. Jesus said in John 8 and 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now we, we are all guilty of misinterpreting this verse because we just talk about our own version of truth. Step in somebody's toes and you'll just have to go for it to get over it. Because we will be. Watch out from here. You ever had to confront somebody and you knew they were wrong, and, but yet you confronted them and you were just kind of blatant and you were kind of in their face and you even used this as justification to say, well, you just need to know the truth because the truth is going to set you free. Hello? You just me. Am I making any sense this morning? Yeah. Okay. We tend to use this verse, and we use it out of context, and we, we, we use it in a way that doesn't necessarily fit the bill in all cases because we take truth and we, we define truth as what we think is true. We think that if we say the word truth, that it's truth as long as we believe it's true. But can I tell you that one of the main things that truth is that Jesus was talking about was God's truth, God's word. What God has said about any matter is what truth is. If God has said homosexuality is a sin, then whether you agree with it or not, homosexuality is a sin. That's right. If God has said abortion is murder and that you know that you shall not shed innocent blood, then I'm sorry, no matter what political stance you have, abortion is murder and God declares that it is a sin. Yeah. Well,
whether you want to believe it or not, that shacking up and living together before you get married is not in God's plan and is wrong. I'm sorry, but it is wrong because God says it's wrong. Amen. Truth is what God has to say on any matter. And truth and what God has to say is truth whether you agree with it or not. And it was, it, it's bad that I have to say that we have to say that in the church and all. And again, I'm not pointing anybody out, but we live in a society that has tried to tell us that we can make our own version of truth. But I want to just declare to all of you, this right here is the word of truth. It has always been the word of truth. And what this book says is what will stand forever, whether we want to believe it and receive it or not. Amen. A lot of people, even in the church, are living in a bondage mentality because they have yet to truly understand the truth of God or they refuse to accept it. So Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. You want to be free? Read this. Stay in the book and you'll, you, you'll net, you will have an arsenal to keep you from being bound up in the things of this world. But then Jesus was also talking about himself. See, you need to realize that from Genesis all the way to Revelation, everything that is written, even in the law, always points back to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said in John 5 and 39, he was talking to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He said, but these are they which testify of me. Jesus was saying, the truth is good. The word is good. It is truth. But you need to understand that the truth found in your, in your scriptures, the truth found in your Bible, is always testifying of me. And so what truth means in the sense of what Jesus was saying is, yes, it's the word of God. But number two, it is that the truth is whatever the word has to say about Jesus Christ and what he came to do. The truth is, is that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He was, he, he was born of a virgin. He came and he lived a perfect life. He died a criminal's death. He was in the grave for three days. He was resurrected on the third day. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and is one day going to come back and rapture those who are looking for yes. his soon return. What Jesus was saying is everything that he came to do, all the things he had preached about himself, all the prophecies that spoke about who the Messiah would be, that is the word of truth, and that is the truth which will make you free. Amen. He said in Luke chapter 4, we just read it, and he, he quoted Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. He said, <clears throat> excuse me, he said that, that the spirit of the Lord has been upon him and has anointed him to preach the gospel, heal the brokenhearted, listen to this, and to proclaim liberty to the captives and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. But I want you to look at the word anointed. The word anointed means to set apart. It means to duly authorize. It means to be, to be chosen by God for a special job, a special uh, a special operation and to be duly chosen to perform a certain work. Give you an example. <clears throat> About a year ago, my MacBook laptop crashed and I, and I could not for the life of me figure out what had happened. I called Apple support. God bless anybody who ever has to call Apple support. You will test your sanctification calling Apple support. I called them. I waited on hold for 30 minutes. And finally, this woman answered. I told her what was wrong. And she said, sir, I'm sorry. I am not authorized to perform that. Let me send you to my manager. I waited another 15 minutes. The woman gets on the phone. I tell her, sir, I'm sorry. I am not authorized to perform that. Let me send you to so-and-so. Wait another 45 minutes. Another lady answers the phone. Finally, after about two hours, the last girl who answered the phone, because I was just a little evangelically ticked off, and I, I stayed saved, don't worry. But I finally said, ma'am, I do not mean to be ugly. Before I even, before you even tell me you're going to transfer me, this time when you transfer me, please send me to somebody who knows what they're doing and can fix this problem. I had a problem and I needed somebody who had the authority to fix it. Because everybody else didn't have the authority and therefore my problem persisted. What Jesus was saying is he was the one who had been delegated the authority. He had been duly authorized.
arise, he had been duly chosen by God the Father to be the one who would provide freedom to all that would believe on him, and he had all authority to do just that. Can I tell you that one of our problems this morning, the reason why many of us don't have absolute freedom, is because we've been going to the wrong sources. Oh, come on. Jesus said that the truth shall make you free, and that he, being the truth, was the one anointed to set free. He did not say that it was a relationship that would give you freedom. He did not say going to the bottle would give you freedom. Hello? Amen. He did not say going to the psychiatrist and getting all of these anxiety pills and all that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with mental health, but what I'm telling you is we rely too much on other sources when Jesus said any that would come unto him would be free and would be free indeed. And the word indeed means totally, completely, without reservation. He said who the Son sets free is totally and completely free. No bondage, no leftovers, no chains, totally free. Am I making sense this morning? Amen. What we need to understand about freedom is that Jesus is the only one who can provide that freedom. Many of you already know this, but I want to remind you that when the enemy comes and tries to put you under bondage, don't run to Google and start trying to figure out how to get out of it. Don't run to the, ch to the church gossip corner, which we don't have one, and if we ever do, I'll shut it down. But don't run to the gossip and Facebook prayer page and start pouring all your stuff out. Get down on your knees, open your leather Bible, and ask the Lord to bring that freedom because he is the only yeah. one that can provide yeah. it for you. Jesus is the source of our freedom. Amen. He is the one that has given us complete and total liberty. But see, here's the, here's the thing. And here's where we as the saints struggle. We talk about freedom, but yet we don't truly understand it in the sense of we don't truly grasp what we have been freed from. When we talk about freedom, and this is not a bad thing, we relegate freedom to heaven. We always say, well, Jesus came and he set me free. Now I'm, I'm no longer hell bound. Now I'm heaven bound. And, 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 and that's great. But see, the thing is, Jesus told us that this freedom was to bring us life, but life more abundantly. John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life. That's eternal life and have it more abundantly. That's this life. He didn't just come so that we could receive an eternal reward and be transitioned into heaven when our day comes. But he came so that here on this earth, when we're walking through this wilderness of the world, that we did not have to struggle with bondage. We did not have to struggle with darkness. But he was saying, I've set you free from hell in, in eternity and on earth. We have been free so that we can live a totally liberated life. We don't have to walk around like we're always disappointed, people. He said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus brings freedom into our life. And that freedom is a freedom that covers Four major things, and all of this, whether you believe it or not, this, these four things are going to be the thing that if you will remember this, they will give you an arsenal, they will give you a weaponry that will always work against the enemy, and they will, they will keep you in that mindset of salvation, of realizing you do not have to walk around this world defeated. You can stand victorious because you have been made free. Amen. Are you ready for the word? Two of them. Are you ready for the word? Yes. <clears throat> Jesus has set us free. The first thing he has freed us from is he has freed us from the debt of sin. Has anybody in here got a debt that just won't go away? Just me. Okay. All right. I have God knows how much money in student loans. And now that Taylor's going back to school, I'm thinking, oh, great, more. But then... When, when, I mean, we, we've got student loans, we've got a car payment, we've got all these other things, and those are just debts that will not go away. It seems 
sometimes every month, while I pay my payment on crime, while I try to add, add more to the principal, while I try to do all this, it just seems to me, Brother Tommy, that these debts just will not disappear. I'm thinking, God, barring a miracle, and you make me a millionaire, I'm just going to have this the rest of my life. <laughs> because no matter how hard I try, it seems I cannot make any headway. Can I tell you that sin is the same way? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they incurred a debt that they could not pay. And when that debt was placed upon their head, that debt began to be passed on to every person who was ever born in this world. Amen. And as that sin was, as that debt was passed on, humanity and humankind tried to set up systems to get rid of this debt. Every year on the Day of Atonement, they would offer a sacrifice. And, and, and then they would, they would put the blood on the altar, and that would, that would make them good for a year. But he, see, here's the thing about the, the Day of Atonement. That was a payment made on their account just in the nick of time. That was a payment that you would make the day before that it's due and thinking, dear God, I hope it posts by tomorrow morning. Because all the, all the sacrifices were, were the layaway plan. They were just paying on the layaway plan, hoping eventually something would satisfy the debt. But nothing they did, nothing we tried, would ever satisfy the debt of sin. No, much, no matter how many goats, no how, how many lambs, how many doves, how many anything were killed, the, there was gallons upon gallons of blood poured out, and yet none of it ever came close to paying off the debt that was owed to a holy God. Now, some people have asked, well, why couldn't, why couldn't have God made it a little easier on us? Because if God would have reduced the debt, then he would have compromised his nature. Hmm. Yes. Amen. If God would have reduced the debt where mankind could pay it, then he no longer would be the perfect holy God that he is. The sin of humanity was a sin against the perfect and holy nature of God. And so, therefore, God required a perfect sacrifice. A sacrifice that was equated to his holy character. And because man was imperfect, nothing we did would satisfy. Because you cannot buy your way, bribe your way, or try your way back to perfection. And so mankind just kept doing, kept trying. And yet nothing ever could face the debt. But thank God, and I am ready to preach now. Thank God that one day, and from the very foundation of the world, God said, mankind has a debt they cannot pay. Nobody down there is perfect enough to do it. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send my one and my only son, the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh, who's just as perfect, just as holy, and just as righteous as I am. And when I send him, he's going to be born just so that he can die. And when he dies, I'm going to erase the certificate of debt that is on your account and you no longer have any Amen. charges against you. Amen. Thank God that Amen. he sent the one true Messiah to shed his blood. Because when Jesus shed his blood, Colossians tells me that he wiped out the certificate of debt, nailing it to the cross. When Jesus cried, it is finished, he was declaring that debt has been paid, paid in full. They're no longer in owings to God. They are no longer in debt. Their account has been cleared. Yes. Hallelujah for that. Amen. Come on, give me pray. Amen. God decided that since mankind could not find a way that he would make a way for us. We owe a debt we could not pay, and Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. And while I hate he had to go through what he went through, I'm thankful that today my record is clear in heaven. There's no longer a blemish on my record. Yes. No matter what I've done, the debt has been cleared, and I can stand before God no longer in debt to him, but free and free indeed. Yes, amen. He has freed us from the debt of sin. The debt that we owe to God was paid by Jesus Christ. We've been freed from the debt. But second thing, we've been freed from the guilt of sin. Just 
just like the debt of sin was passed down through Adam and Eve, so there was also a guilty verdict that was placed upon humanity. When Adam and Eve sinned and God came looking for them in the cool of the day and he asked, where are you? And they stood before him naked and he said, who told you you were naked? They automatically were on trial. Here stood two human beings, and they were standing before the holy judge of the world. And little did we know it, but heaven's courts were in session. And God started saying, who told you this? And then they bring the serpent into the mix, and, and all this has been revealed. And without realizing that Adam and Eve, while they were confessing their sin, they were also making a confession of their guilt. They stood before the righteous judge, Misty, and when they were done speaking, God said, I hate to do it, but I declare you guilty. And from that moment on, there was a chasm created between man and God. And man had a guilty verdict. They had a, they had a judgment upon their life. There was a guilty verdict placed on all of us. And just like with the dead, mankind tried everything that we could to get rid of it. But the sacrifice wasn't nothing but a cover. It was just us trying to cover up what we had done. Uh, we tried to, we tried to satisfy, we tried to get this, this, this charge on our record removed by doing good things and by serving, serving God. But see, even the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags in His sight. We tried all we could to get the debt paid and get the charge against us eradicated. But see, the law was was clear. That the soul who sins must die. It was clear that the wages of sin was death. And God in his holy nature could not change what was owed to him. And therefore that the charge on our record could not be dropped. We stood guilty before a holy God. God said in his law in a matter of speaking. You are guilty, and justice requires your life. Each and every one of us, when we were born in this world, David said we were brought forth in iniquity. We were born into sin. That's right. That's why we have to be born again. Amen. Hello. Yes. We were born into sin. We were born into an imperfect flesh. And therefore, from the time that we entered this world, we stood before the courts of heaven with a guilty verdict on our life. We stood before the courts of heaven, and every time we did something wrong, there stood the accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting lawyer, Satan himself, saying, God, did you see what they did? I've got proof of it. Did you see the lie that they told? I've got proof of it. And all these things, Sister Tina, the charges started adding up. We stood before the throne, and there stood the prosecutor, and we stood on trial, and God said, I demand your life. Justice demands your life, but out of the back corner comes a man and says, you may require their life, but let me step in their place. Let me come and let me take death all for them. I'm standing here today that Jesus came and stood in my place, yes. and he took my place where I deserve to die, yes. and he died a criminal's death. He died the death that I deserve also that my debt and that my crime and that I no longer had to stand guilty before God, but he who knew no sin became sin so that I might be called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus yes. our Lord. Amen. We stood before God a criminal, but Jesus stood in our place. And he said, God, their life, if you take all their lives, it's going to demand every one of their lives. But if you'll take mine, Lord, I can cover it all. If you'll take my life, Lord, I can suffice it all. I'm the perfect lamb, and if you'll let me go, I'll die that death. I'll take their place. I'll be their substitute. And when he bled out, all of the charges against us were dropped. All of the charges on our record were removed. The verdict was overturned, and we are no longer called sinners. We are no longer called criminals. We are no longer fugitives, but we are sons and daughters. Amen. We are righteous in God's sight. Yes, amen. Jesus 
in his death and his resurrection remove not only the debt of our sin, but the guilt of our sin. He not only paid our debt, but he credited our account. And that means we have a perfect surplus. He not only took away our guilt, but his righteousness was imputed upon each and every one of us who confess him as Lord. That means no longer are we to be condemned because the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 1 that we have been justified through faith. Do you know what justified means? It is a legal term that means to be acquitted. That means our sins have been acquitted. That means all of our charges have been removed. That means we no longer stand guilty, but we have been justified. Amen. Just if yes. I have never sinned, right. and I have been called right, yes. I have been called whole, and now I am back in fellowship with my Father. Amen. We have been justified and declared righteous. You know what that means? righteous, do you know what that means for me and you? That means no longer do we have to entertain or do we have to give place to the devil and his accusations. Amen. One of our problems is we entertain that little idiot way too much. Yes, yes I call yeah. him an idiot because that's what he is. I call him a lot of other things, but I'm going to stay sanctified in God's house today, okay? But we listen to him way too much, can we? Yes. Oh, Maybe if we listen to the voice of God as much as we listen to the voice of the devil, maybe we get somewhere. <laughs> we listen to him way too much. And what, we do, and what we fail to realize, Sister Tina, is the Bible says he is a liar and the father of all lies. Yeah. Yet we put more stock in what he says. We mm -hmm. put more stock in what he says than what this holy book says, and we wonder why we messed up. Because do you know what he tells us on a given day? Teresa, you are no good. You don't deserve to be in that church. You get up there and you shout, and you know what you're doing. Susan, who do you think you are? Posting scripture. That we, I know. Just tell them what if they only knew. That church only knew. They would keep you out the back door. Am I speaking to anybody? I'll tell you what he tells me all the time. I, I, I'm telling you, I sit at my desk every Monday and I'll start writing a sermon and he just laughs. And he'll laugh and laugh and he'll say, if they only knew that thought you had yesterday. And what gets me is he'll plant a thought in your mind yes. and you'll rebuke it then make you feel guilty because the thought was there in the first place. Yes, amen. He'll bring up all these sins. He'll just start throwing all these accusations at you. And he'll start making you feel like you're the worst person in the world. That you don't even need to go to church. There ain't no need to pray. There ain't no need to read your word. Because you're a filthy sinner who don't deserve nothing but hell. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? No condemnation means that the guilty verdict has been overturned. That means he can accuse you of what he wants to accuse you of. But God said when you ask for forgiveness, he cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. He throws them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anymore. So when that dumb devil starts raising his head up and reminding you, you just remind him, devil, I might have been there at one time, but I've been washed. I've been sanctified. I've been justified. I'm no longer that person. I am righteous in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have been justified just if I had never sinned. Amen. All my past has been wiped away. I've been washed. We need to grasp that reality. We 
we are not dirty before God. Stop saying this. Stop saying I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You are not a sinner anymore. We were what sinners, but have been made righteous. Don't give the devil the foothold. Don't give him that joy of saying what you once were. Your identity in Christ has changed. You have been born again. And records in heaven bear that out. You bring up your past, God has no clue what you're talking about. He chooses to forgive. We've been justified. We have been saved and we have been freed from the guilt of sin. I've got to We've been freed from the debt of sin. We've been freed from the guilt of sin. But here's another thing. We've been freed from the power of sin. When you were in the world, you were a slave to darkness. Romans chapter 6, verse 20 says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. A slave means somebody who was held in captivity or a prisoner of war. What that means is when we were in the world, everything that sin demanded us to do, we had to obey. If it told us to told us to lie, we had no option but to lie. If it told us to talk to, to cuss at somebody, we had no choice but to cuss at somebody. We were under a tyrannical ruler who everything that was demanded of us had to be performed because we were free from the obligation to do right. But when Jesus came, He said that He came and was anointed to proclaim liberty to the captives. He was brought to declare freedom to those who were bound in darkness. He was brought to declare absolute total freedom to and removal of restraint to all those who were in the world. Do you know what that means? We are no longer obliged to sin, but we are obliged to righteousness. We are no longer under the power of sin and have to obey its demands. We are under the power of righteousness and have the authority to rebuke temptation. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that in every temptation there is a way of escape. See, a lot of people, especially young Christians, I know I struggle with when we get saved, we get saved. But the problem is we still have to be sanctified. Hello? We said, I'm in saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Woo! Bless you if you were sanctified immediately. Mine was a process. Still happening. Every day of my life. Amen. And without realizing it, in our young, immature Christianity, we think because we've been saved that we'll no longer be tempted. And then when we get tempted, we question and say, well, I thought I was saved. Am I talking to anybody? We, I thought I was saved. I thought this meant this wouldn't happen no more. And, and because we misunderstand, angel, then we feel like we've got to give in. We've been saved, but our flesh still has to be sanctified. And because we fail to realize that sometimes, we think just because a temptation comes our way and because it's hard, we have no choice but to give in. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ came to set us free from the power of sin. That means you no longer have to obey its orders. You no longer have to give in to its demands. That means when you get tempted that you have an authority and you have the right as a bought and forgiven child of God to rebuke the temptation and to walk away and to walk in the righteousness wherewith Christ has made you free. We don't have to give in anymore. We don't have to obey. Paul said we're no longer slaves to sin, but bond slaves to Christ. Good. It means everything he says we do, every other command we put aside. Am I making sense to some of you? I'm going to hurry up and close because these two are pretty good for each other. But we're going to get going. <laughs> Thank God it's raining. I can go another hour. Paul wrote in Romans 8 and verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. We have changed 
We have changed jurisdictions. We are no longer under the, 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 the law of sin. We are under the law of righteousness. We have been emancipated. The last thing that Christ freed us from, he freed us from the debt of sin, the guilt of sin, the power of sin, and the last one is the stronghold of sin. And this is the thing that I think more Christians than any deal with. See, I'm just going to say it the way that it came to me, and this is not theologically sound. Somebody help me and send me to somebody that can help me understand this better. But while we were saved and while we were born again, we were still and are still fleshly human beings. So while our lives have been made new, unfortunately there is still residue of the past that we still have to work with. Because while I was saved at 16, it's taken me up till now to finally get my tongue under control where I don't just tell people what I think. And I still have to knock on it every day. Because Facebook and God help me not to ask that. <clears throat> it goes back to the sanctification thing. And what we don't realize is that while there's residue of our past left, that can create a stronghold in our life. And once a stronghold is created, because a stronghold is a fortified wall, it's something, that's what Jericho was. Jer the walls of Jericho, it was a stronghold. Go and research it. Built up walls that you could not penetrate. And the enemy will find things like that in your life to build strongholds in your mind, in your spirit, to prevent you from walking in full liberty. Going with me. Are you staying with me this morning? Because there is a residue left in our life and there is still things we're having to work through, a lot of us feel as if we do not measure up, we have not yet arrived, and we continually give in to certain things. And can I tell you, whatever you feed is what will grow. Whatever you feed is what will grow. The more you feed that mentality, the more it's going to grow and the bigger the stronghold gets. See, we're all talking about strongholds just being fleshly sins like pornography and, 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 and sexual immorality and, and drug addiction. Those are strongholds, but we also have strongholds of anxiety. Strongholds of depression. Strongholds of, of, of lack of self-worth. Strongholds of, get this one, negativity. Yeah. Poor, pitiful me mentality. Yeah. And the enemy builds these up because we entertain it. It's all connected. And the more we entertain it, the bigger those strongholds get. And Christians today are struggling and they are battling. Because there are strongholds, mental strongholds, emotional strongholds, spiritual strongholds being built in their life that, ex that keeps them from experiencing the full liberty that Christ came to give. But Jesus was emphatic when he said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Totally and completely free. He said in Luke 4 and 18 that he was anointed to set at liberty those who were oppressed or in prison. He came to set you free not only from your debt, not only from your guilt, not only from the power, but he came to remove anything in your life that would prevent you from living abundantly here on this earth. So he was telling all of those who were imprisoned within themselves, you can walk out of this jail cell. I have come to proclaim liberty to the prisoners. I have opened the door because he said, I hold the keys of hell, death, and the grave. And so I'm here to tell you this morning, no matter what jail cell you find yourself in, if you're in a jail cell of fear, if you're in a jail cell of depression, if you're in a jail cell of addiction, Jesus Christ has already unlocked the door and all you've got to do is take your authority and walk out because you have been set free. Amen. Yes. Missy, I'm almost done. He said, I have come to declare.
declare liberty to the captives and to the oppressed. To those who were held in the jail cell of their own mind and their own emotions. This is the one thing that I think every one of us in this room in some form can say, I've got something I've got to get past. I've got something I need to be set free from. This morning, my entire purpose to bring you this message was to remind you that you don't have to constantly feel lost, defeated, oppressed. You don't have to constantly feel like you're walking around aimlessly in darkness. Because Jesus Christ has declared through his death, burial, and resurrection that those who put their trust in him are free, and we are free indeed. That means you don't have to be a slave to your emotions no more. You don't have to be a slave to that past anymore. You don't have to identify the way you used to identify anymore. You don't have to entertain the voice of the enemy anymore. You have been justified, you have been set free, and you have the authority to walk out that freedom in Christ Jesus. So this morning I want you to stand. And Brother Eddie, you can go ahead and stop the video. This is the way I want to do it.